And the next one is the proposed Freedom Camping Bylaw 2015. Do I have a mover of the resolution? Andrew Turner, seconded um, Glenn Livingston. Is there any discussion? Andrew. I had a question, if I oh, may, please. Who have um, we got here for bylaws? And it okay. really just relates to where from here. Clearly, we're going out for a period of public consultation. Are there any public meetings proposed as a, um, a part of that public consultation? And if so, has a timetable been worked out, or how is it expected they would run? Um, Yes, Councillor Turner, there are two meetings organised. Um, I understand one in the New Brighton area and one over in Akaroa. Um, we do have a timeline for those. I don't have them with me right now, but I could get that to you by email after All this right. meeting. Yep. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was just concerned that there, were, there wasn't any mention of that. But, um, yeah, no, pleased to hear that there are public meetings, and exactly as I was going to suggest, in the areas which are most likely to, to be affected or where there will be most public interest. Thank you. All right. I'll put the motion. Oh, oh, sorry. No, no, it's fine. I, I just um, I moved an amendment at the committee. It wasn't supported, but just to be consistent, I'd want to move it again here. And if that fails, so be it. But um, it's just about uh, putting something that I think was a better suggestion. Now, what was your, what was your one? The amendment was, um, if you recall, to this um, back to this meeting, that under the. Um, uh, the statement of proposal, I believe that the bylaw uh, didn't go far enough around restricting freedom camping and consulting on it. So I uh, moved an amendment that under the um, statement of proposal that the areas that contained a five day maximum stay became a maximum of three days and the areas that uh, allowed for a maximum of three days stay or three nights stay became a maximum of one night stay. It wasn't supported there. I'd move it again here because I believe that's the better way to go and as a councillor that's kind of your job. Okay. Well we've got the we, we we know the general gist of it. Do I have a seconder for that, David East? Right. So um Should I speak to it quickly then? Yeah, if you could speak to it, yeah. I'm kind of I have to go from memory here. Um look the the, the gist of it is just from the maps you'll see that um uh the statement of proposal has areas that um uh, well, there's effectively four areas on, on the maps. One is where the freedom camping is allowed, one is where freedom camp camping strictly isn't allowed, and there's two uh, variations of restricted freedom camping, of which there are, uh, it proposes a five-day maximum stay and a three-day maximum stay, and that can also be determined around uh, whether or not the units are self-contained um, and so forth. I won't get bogged down on, on that so much. But the rationale around that was that if you look at the areas which um, allowed for stays, a good chunk of that, probably 80, 90% of it, um, was actually suburban streets around, uh, around the city. Um, so probably every council that sits around this table uh, would have, uh, un un under what we're consulting on, would allow freedom camping outside their house on the street for a number of days. So I was proposing that this simply changed the maximum number of days from everything that says a five-day maximum beco uh, then becomes a three-day maximum, and that a three-day maximum then becomes a one-night maximum. The reason being, quite simply, I do not believe what we're going out and consulting on goes far enough, and um, the intent of this is to find appropriate places for people to camp. And I'll tell you where I think an appropriate place for people to camp is, and that's camping grounds, not suburban streets. And I don't think that goes far enough, and I think it's very relaxed around allowing freedom camping outside your house, which I don't believe is really in the best interest of the city, so that's why I'm moving this. It still has a period of grace, but it doesn't uh, go as, um, it's not as relaxed as what I believe that we're going out and consulting on. It's slightly tighter, and that's really... But I don't. I don't like to do this, but but that's incorrect because we can. We're only we're only talking about what we can in, in fact cover by the bylaw, which are reserves. So I'm in council property. So yes, yeah, council owned and managed property. Yes. Yeah. Council what? Sorry. Council council owned and managed property is is the only areas in which we can. Uh, this bylaw applies. Yeah. So we can't do it for. Uh, we can't say that there's a the bylaw won't. If you. Where are we? If you look at the maps, 
But of course, there are roads that we own. Yeah, yeah. our roads, exactly. Yes. Which is council owned. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So roads and everything, that, that's why all the maps that are attached with this. No, ro roads are owned by council. So you've got a, a maximum of, I don't have, the, the maps aren't on this one, but can you just help me out here for the wider city? I, I, I have a feeling it might have been three nights maximum in, in a lot of the areas around the suburban areas. It was, it's different for whether it's self-contained or non-self-contained. So yeah. self-contained is a maximum of five nights, non-self-contained is a maximum of three, isn't it? Oh. Depends where it is. Depends. Okay. It's, so a, it's a mixture. It is a mixture. Yeah. So, so for simplicity's sake, all I'm proposing is that everything that, um, that reads a maximum of five nights stay becomes a maximum of three nights stay, and everything that says a maximum of three nights stay becomes a maximum of one night stay. So it strengthens it, it tightens it, because I don't believe that it is tight enough. And as I said, I believe the appropriate place for camping really is camping grounds. So my uh, desire for this bylaw is to be actually um, far more tight around freedom camping and uh, to, to not really promote it as, uh, as freely as what it has been in the past. I thought we had advice on this, but anyway. Um, Can I ask a question? Oh, well, obviously we're going to have to have some questions now because... Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know what the legal ramifications are because freedom camping is essentially illegal activity. You're permitted. Is it too restrictive in what you do with the downfall? Is there more of an opportunity or chance for it to be challenged legally as being too restrictive of illegal <coughs> activity? Yeah. Um, the Act requires us to take a proportionate approach to deciding on the freedom camping areas. So um, in terms of the mix of the, the three days and five days, probably Tina and Claire can talk about that a little bit more in terms of the rationale, but part of it was to do with um, providing people, those who do choose to freedom camp, because you're not going to get everyone into freedom camping ground uh, for, into camping grounds. Um, provide them with a, a, a proportionate approach in relation to what the problems and um, that we can address. So the, the question is: Is what Councillor Goss proposing <coughs> considered too restrictive on the basis that freedom camping is in fact legal? Um, it could be uh, the one. I think the three days are, is only or does relate to where people are camping in self-contained vehicles, but. Mm -hmm. It's because the self-contained vehicles have got the three days. The three days came because of the, the, the capacity to store waste for, for three days. And the five days came up to some extent in association with Banks Peninsula being very much a holiday, you know, like traditional camping area, mm. perhaps a little bit more. So that was where the five days sort of became, becomes relevant because people are often in that, on, on the Banks long Peninsula weekend, for the long weekend. weekends. But it wouldn't stop people parking outside your house? No, no, no. No, you could have visitors coming and staying outside your house in their camping thing. Um, Andrew? So just to follow on from Ali's question, which is, is very similar to the question that I'm about to ask, but I'll just be a little bit more specific about it. In terms of Section 11 of the Act, um, and in terms in particular of the um, Thames Coromandel case, if this amendment were to be carried, would that expose us to a greater level of legal risk in terms of people saying that we were being too restrictive than if the amendment wasn't passed. Does the amendment this is what we are to consulting on too. legal risk? <clears throat> um, not necessarily, because I think you, for, the, for consultation purposes, you do have to, well, you know, to go out with this for consultation um, is, I guess, saying that's your position, um, and if we didn't get any submissions, then that's what would be passed as the bylaw. Um, there is a risk that someone might say that um, it's you're taking too restrictive approach, but given that we are, we do have a mix of areas <coughs> where there's no controls. Um, there are controls in terms of self-contained vehicles only, and some areas where it's um, in the city where you can camp in a non-self-contained vehicle. 
but there's still also areas of our district where there isn't any controls proposed at all um, in the more rural areas. Then I think the difference between how many nights restriction you put is probably not going to put us at risk. But I think you. But it, it's about is that a proportionate res response to the um, nuisance that we've heard about and the evidence, you know, of complaints and um, yeah. Have you had many complaints from residential streets around Christchurch? I, I don't say there's many, but there are the occasional complaints. And perhaps that's um, a question that Craig might be better to answer from compliance. But we do know, I mean, when we were doing the research for the, for the bylaw, I mean, it's fairly obvious that every now and again people will complain about people, for example, camping um, perhaps associated with a library, you know, quite often, um, which will free often Free Wi-Fi. Yeah, free Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, associated with a residential area. Craig, I'm sure there, Craig's compliance, he might be able to better answer that. Yeah, there have been um, a couple of... Come forward, come forward. A couple of key areas where um, we have had numerous complaints, and that's around, uh, I guess, where people of Freedom Campers have congregated in large groups close to residential areas. Um, Beresford Street, Waimari Surf Club being the, the main examples of that. Yeah, but, but they're, main, they're mainly sort of kind of associated with a beach environment. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. what oh, about in the... Yeah. But, yeah, oh, and intermittent complaints, and, and largely relating from a freedom camper parking up outside somebody's house. Right. Yeah. Um, libraries, Fendleton Library, uh, uh, an example of that, where there's, yeah, making use of the Wi-Fi. I wouldn't say there's a, a pattern of complaints, no. but they pop up from time to time when we have... Have people uh, okay? So, so we but we're, we're being very mindful that our response has to be proportionate. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Glenn. Thank you. Just looking at the attachment there, under, just looking at the attachment under one point three, um, duration doesn't seem to be a theme that leaps out for me in reading that. It does come up under the general section where it says, e.g., three to five nights. Can I ask, was that? Uh, proposed or a, a kind of an example of duration, something that came from uh, respondents themselves, or is that a well, for, for we a staff? With, you know? We ended up with the balance of those nights after consultation. So, in within the the project team, there was quite a bit of discussion around one day, two days, three days, five days, and the feedback we had <coughs> was around um, enabling people to be able to go away for a four day weekend on the peninsula or, or wherever and being able to stay there. So that's where we came back with the balance of those days. Fully aware that we'll go up for consultation and can come back or will be increased. All right, so um, Paul. Yeah. We, we, we have actually uh, history with actually freedom camping in the central city around Cranmer Square where you do get accumulation of people parking up outside residential properties near a park and it does cause a lot of problems. I would be very, very concerned that if we allowed you know, the central city streets to be a place where they could park up for three or four days, we're going to end up with more problems. So I'm actually oh. strongly supporting uh, yeah, um, uh, um, Jamie's amendment, because I think we really need to no, consider... There, there's it's there's no, it's none allowed on the CBD. The CBD is completely ringed off. Talking central, central yeah, city Central streets? city, yeah. none. It's city streets? It's Between prohibited the so in the central city. Yeah, but the city streets, same thing. We've had the problem in central city where they park outside a park. That'll happen in residential areas where there's a nice park. They'll park up out there and it'll have the same okay. sort of problems. No, as long as you understand city. that they're two separate things. Yep. All right, well, we'll put the amendment then. Um, so it looks as if there's a bit of a balance here. So let's um, vote on it electronically. Oh, that's equal, so it doesn't move forward. It stays the same. So I'll put the motion. Um, no. We'll, yes, I know it's a democracy, but Yanni, I called for, I put the motion, and I, I, I called for people to speak. Nobody spoke. No, well, okay, you, you speak. Um, I just want to 
to make the very quick point that this is going out for public consultation, so there's a number of concerns that have been raised, but they should be addressed, be able to be addressed through that public consultation in terms of addressing those individual concerns. And I do think it is really important to recognise that um, it's not just about clamping down on freedom camping, but it is about managing it um, in a more appropriate way. And the fact is that we need tourism in our city, and this is actually a, a very um, important part of tourism coming into uh, whether it's the city centre or, or the suburbs. So um, I think the bylaw is trying to get a balance and I encourage people to make submissions if they're still concerned. Well said. Andrew. Um, yeah, I certainly welcome this going out for um, public consultation. I've kept a, a very keen eye on, on this work as it's gone through. We obviously have particular interests on the peninsula around problems that we've had with um, freedom camping, but clearly there have been problems elsewhere in the city as well. I think this is a very pragmatic approach, but certainly would reiterate the comments that um, Councillor Johansson has made. This is a proposal going out for public consultation. I'm very aware that there will be some aspects of this that will be contentious and will provoke submissions and we, we certainly look forward to hearing people's views expressed through those submissions so that what we end up with is the best bylaw we possibly can that gives us the best way of dealing with this, both from a restricting and enabling point of view. So certainly very supportive of this going out to public consultation and look forward to hearing the views of, um, of the people that um, have got views on it. Excellent. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. The next um, item on the agenda is the residential land availability in Christchurch City. We didn't um, get an opportunity to deal with this at Strategy and Finance due to time constraints. So, um, Ivan, I'm not sure if you want to kind of um, take us through it or. Well, the, the key point is that. Um, Councillors, is that the LERP requ has required us to um, ensure that there is a sufficient supply of residential land until 2028. And this report uh, shows that uh, the Council is almost certain, you know, should meet those obligations and meet that target. Um, probably a couple of key points to emerge from this report are firstly that uh, it is a benefit really of the work that the council did um, prior to the earthquakes in the areas of South West and Belfast and doing the area planning work because the money that was put into the infrastructure and the planning that was put into the um, um, the provision of land use for housing and industry at that time um, has paid dividends because that all that area is now largely unconstrained and similarly for Belfast. Um, so I think that's that's one key message. Um, most of the growth will occur in the southwest in the foreseeable future, um, with uh, with others occurring around Bel uh, and uh, obviously Preston's. But there will be a gradual movement of growth from the southwest to the north over the planned period. So most of the growth will occur in those planned areas around um, uh, Hallswell, Wigram, and uh, West Hallswell uh, over the next five to ten years. High fields, uh, uh, parts of Belfast and Upper Sticks probably will be a bit later on. So, just a couple of interesting things to come out of um, um, out, out of these figures. Um, there is, no, I mean, these figures don't include the Port Hills vacant land. So, there's an extra 500 hectares of land on the Port Hills. Uh, some of it's uh, subject to um, a hazard constraint, but not a lot. So, all in all, the council is in a very good position as far as land supply goes to meet the current, the future housing needs. Questions? Yanni? Thank you for including the section 224. Um, so that, that basically 2,633 is the number that have certificates of title. Certificates of title. So basically um, out of the 20,000 sections available, um, only 2,600 have got certificates of title. Yeah, 2,600, but when you say only councillor, that, that's quite a, a number at the, the rate at which land has been taken up. So, uh, and, and that is likely to, to be quite constant as subdivisions come through. So, uh, and I'm pretty confident that that, um, that number of you know, titled sections uh, provides a, a good choice and availability. So just in terms of the current sections that we have mm. um, that are able to get the S224s um, if everything's 
done. So we, we would have basically about 6,000. So you've got the 10,500 that's been rezoned. There's 10,000, that's correct. And of that, you've got um, 5,000 that's been consented or subject to application for subdivision. Yes. So those ones are the ones that could get the S224? Yes, the ne that's the next stage. Um, so just really trying to understand, in terms of people's choice, we don't know whether they're on the market or not. But basically, we, there's about five, five, 5,000 that people possibly could be looking at right now out of the um, Absolutely, yes. They, um, they wouldn't necessarily want to purchase them with that title, but they would be, um, that they're in the process of being, of being developed and, and um, uh, um, they're not what's called shovel re ready, but um, they're well on the way. Okay, so do we know how many are shovel ready? Well, that's the ones I'd say that are titled. They're, once they're titled, you could actually um, start putting a house on them straight away. And then just the other, the final question is, do we are we looking at what's happening in Selwyn and Waimak in terms of land availability and what's the kind of, how many sections are available there? And is that something we could get? I think it would be really interesting. I certainly could get those figures. I haven't got them with me, but um, um, I, I know uh, uh, anecdotally that Rolleston is, is, and Lincoln have a lot of sections available. I look, but I can't put figures on that, but more than happy to provide those figures. I think that'd be quite useful to okay. see what's happening and why we can sell sure. them in particular. Ivan, it's pretty fair to say that actually often a developer will develop a uh, subdivision and often will sell the land subject to title. Um, that's, that could be yeah, my understanding that happens. And yes. do, do we know how many have been sold subject to title? No, I haven't got those figures, I'm sorry. No. Any others? Uh, Glenn? At some point I'd like to make a couple of comments, if I may. Not, not questions to Ivan, but just on this. Cool. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Do we...? Sorry, Paul and Jamie. So, uh, yes, I'll call the speakers to the resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look, just, just a couple of comments. I, I feel that we've answered the land supply um, question as um, a council, uh, working with what we're required to do um, under the LERP. There's been an inquiry from the Productivity Commission over land supply. I think it's followed that here in Canterbury it hasn't necessarily followed that in uh, meeting supply that affordability has been addressed. So the Productivity Commission undertakes work from time to time over various subjects it has over land supply. What I would like at some point addressed is construction costs, that part as it relates to housing. So I really think that needs looking into. They have increased due to uh, building requirements after the uh, Canterbury experience, but still there are some big questions I think we need to look at over supply chains and getting those costs down. Councils are often challenged over land supply and regulation, and we've seen media conferences to, to that effect. But, you know, who is actually going to start looking at uh, construction costs? So that's, just wanted to make that point today uh, that I hope that will be a piece of work that's addressed at some point. Very good. Anyone else? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Next item is the uh, Wigram Road Land Options, the Canterbury Agricultural and Pastoral Association Supplementary Report. Who's here for that? Yeah, OK. Tim and David. Do we have a, we must have a staff member here. We've yes. had, yes, yes, yes. oh sorry. <laughs> Afternoon. I guess um, we've had a deputation, so I certainly yes. would appreciate um, the response. We've also just dealt with an item, an item which meant, um, which was a, lease upon a lease upon a right of renewal, which um, mm. has left us uh, several million dollars to shy of where we want to be. So um, right. mm. do you want to talk about the um, suggestion that we 
uh, have a right of renewal on top of the 35-year lease. Yeah, well, this, is, this is really the issue, is whether we go with a 35-year lease. I mean, we think it's in the Council's interest to support the AMP Association. Um, they're obviously looking for 100 years to develop the land, get some tenure, repay their funding, and from 35 years, pay a commercial rent with rent reviews going forward. So it is in our interest, I believe, to support them. Um, you know, I don't know if Andrew's got any more comments about the long-term use of the land, um, but essentially this is the last piece of land in the area. Yeah, no, I understand that, but I mean, it, the mm. question is, is is to put in the right of renewal. That's the question, I guess. Yes. Well, look, we are limited by leasing practices. 35 years is the norm, governed by the Reserve, uh, Resource Management Act, um, so it is highly irregular. So if you have a right of renewal, are you caught by...? Um, well, what we're proposing is they do have an existing licence for 100 years on the park, so we would sync it up with that and make it coterminous so they both exist at the same time mm -hmm. and keep the renewals consistent. So what does that look like? Well, six years would be the initial term, and then it would go through to probably every 10 years after that. Okay. Um, sorry, Tim, Ali, Paul. Yeah, Tim. I mean, although we've had the, the earlier thing with the cart club, I mean the AMP show over has over 100 years history with this city. Mm. They're a major player with this city. They are, the AMP show is a major giver back to this city and is the marriage between country or rural and um, city. So I mean it's so important for us, you're absolutely right, that we, we it is in our best interest to yeah. work with them. Have you talked with, with uh, Ben, etc., about the, the 6, 10 and 10? Because I, I support the 35 plus with, uh, with a right, um, right of renewal yep. because of the history of the association and the, what it gives to our rural and city communities. Yep. No, I absolutely agree. We haven't got down to the details yet, but there are looming subdivision issues, subdivision issues on the main park, which are coming up in six years' time. So they need to be dealt with, I believe, at the same time as well in their existing lease. So have you talked to the association with regards to that? <coughs> yes. Okay. Yep. They're well aware of the requirements there. And what is their feedback with regards to that? Well, they're basically just going to have to start working through it. So essentially, the lease on the existing park around their sales yards needs to be subdivided away from the main title so their lease can continue. Um, their licence is around the outsiders for 100 years, so we want to make this new lease coterminous with the existing lease so that it's an all or nothing situation. Could you do it the other way around? Uh, so we, we do the 35 plus, uh, 35 year lease with right of renewal yeah. on the land that we're discussing now and when it comes you can sync the new leases into that 35 year agreement? Yes, absolutely. I mean, so that would be a positive yep. way forward for all parties? Either way it can be coordinated, it's simply the matter of the the it's term. the outcome you want, not you don't. You, how no. we get there yeah. is yeah, not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ali. Um, the, <coughs> the six ten plus ten. That would you say that that doesn't provide a hell of a lot of um, confidence, I guess, or ability for the AMP to be able to plan and move forward, which is hence the other reason oh, they want the thirty five. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, the only reason, as I say, we're limited to thirty five years recommendation is because of current leasing practices. We have no issue with 100 years. I don't see any foreseeable issues um, with 100 years. Um, it's just how we break up that total term. So that's just an idea at this stage. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, uh, Paul and then Yanni. We're not clear, but we've obviously seen that with the car club issue, you know, with eye watering numbers to move them. Yep. Um, is there a mechanism where we can uh, do the 35-year lease? And that's probably the first question. Is, is the 35-year lease enough time to give them the confidence to actually develop the land? Well, I would personally think so, but they're looking long-term to you know, cement their future they would get the their, They would get their whatever they put in back out again in a 35-year yeah. term. Yeah. Uh, not being a clairvoyant and actually not seeing the future and how uh, you know, this land for whatever reason may be required, mm. is there some sort of exit clause we could put in there that still gives them confidence to um, develop the land for the 35 plus 35, but there yep. may be some exit clause we may need to have in there for whatever reason the in the future? Yes. Um, look, we haven't discussed it at this stage. I think they would be loath to include that if they're going to be building the sort of development they're talking about, being a conference facility. Um, 
we haven't reached any agreement on that yet, no. I'm trying to think of mm. something that actually does allow them to do what they do. Obviously, 35 years, they, yeah. they will pull their money back out. Yeah. It would need to be a substantial reason for us to reclaim the land, I imagine. We haven't included that yet, no. Yeah, it's sort of down there as, you know, um, should they cease to maintain their not-for-profit charitable operating mm. Mm. status, then a market rent will be payable commencing immediately for the balance of the lease term. So mm. I suppose that's the council's protection. Just being a cart club, costing us $7.5 yes. million dollars to move it, so we don't want to be caught in that position again whilst we're getting commercial rent if, if it does. No, it isn't costing us $7.5 million to move it. We've, we've locked in the figure at the lower yeah, rate. Yeah, I understand, but it, it, we didn't. <laughs> we didn't accept that advice. Yeah. Um, Raf? Yeah, just a question on the um, change from the 5.8 hectares to the 5.1. Yes. So that, um, what can we do with that other piece of land? Well, in all honesty, it is a long, thin piece of land. I'm not sure of the... Um, well, I guess from a parks or open space per perspective, its only potential use is in, in open space, natural environment, revegetation, just to buffer the impact of the, of the motorway and the surrounding environment. There's no active use um, that I'm aware of that it could be used for. Potential linkages, and you know, depending on what else develops, but... Yeah, no sorry, Yanni, I skipped over you by okay. accident. Um, I just, just trying to understand the 35 year lease without a subdivision. So, if we went and did a subdivision, we could do a longer lease than 35 years? For any lease longer than 35 years, you need to have a separate title. So, this piece of land is still part of the main title, which includes Canterbury Cultural Park. So, so is part of the solution then when um, you've got the other subdivisions to do? is to just do all that subdivision at the same time Absolutely. and then work out a longer lease term? Yes, that's definitely an option. So what's the timing around doing that? Oh, look, I'm not sure. It could take quite a while. It wouldn't be for this year's show, potentially next year, six months maybe. But it, but it would seem to me that the, the requirement of the association is to get a longer term security than 35 years yes, to enable... Right. I guess the funding of the development that yep. they would propose. We still need to go through a public consultation process for this as well, for any <coughs> lease above six months. So that's the first step after this, right. providing you grant a lease. Um, and if 100 years is given, then they will be on the association to go through the subdivision process. Do you, do you, um, do you think it would be easier if we just sold off the land in Section A? To, the, to, asso them? to the association? Oh, look, that has come up in discussions. I don't believe they're currently in a position to do that. Um, their preference is to lease the land for 35 years, develop it, and then pay a commercial rent going forward. Right, OK. Um, and just in terms of the other use, I mean, obviously we've got Napuna Wai, which is kind of separate but related. Yep. Have, have we looked at issues like car parking on the other outside of Area A, like Area B, as being something that maybe... Absolutely. Yeah, look, I mean, Area B could be used to licence to the association for car parking, perhaps. It comes directly off Wigram Road. I'm not sure how many you could get in there, but that would certainly appease an issue, you know, in five to ten years' time. Okay. So, just so I'm clear, though, we still don't have agreement with the association about the preferred option that you're recommending. They still are concerned about it. They would like 100 years, option B. We are limited to recommending option A, 35 years, but I'm sure you can read between the lines there. So, can we set up a process to try and just can get we, some can we, to resolve? Can we sort of kind of indicate an ability to work towards this, I mean, because it, clearly mm. it relates to the subdivision yep. um, in terms of the timing, but whose idea was it to switch the, the, the it round the other way so that the two became, you know, that the, the two um, lease arrangements became, you know, one yeah. coterminous, as you say, yes. agreement um, <coughs> at the end? Well, it's just about syncing up the dates, it's really. It's just sync up yeah. the dates, yeah. So varying the existing lease, do you mean? Is that what you're saying? You're saying that in 10, 6 years, yep. there's going to be a change. Yes. And that's why you only want to round to 6, or the, the suggestion was a 6 year lease, and then 10. Yes. Turning it the other way around, 
if we give a 35 plus right of renewal for those blocks, yep. and then when you come in six years to yep. look at those others, then sink it into the 35 with a right of renewal for 35 and 30. So yep. the AMP show have certainty of the 100 years, but it's done yep. in a 35, 35, 30 yep. for both blocks of land. Because, I mean, they've been here for 125 years. They're not going anywhere. No, you know, no, that's right. So. Their, yeah, their existing lease on around the sale yards is actually in perpetuity. So that has continual rights of renewal for 10 years, but that is subject to the subdivision process they have to do in six years' time. That's a bit confusing, but... They, they have an ongoing lease there, so there's no issue in that regard. I, I yeah. guess what I was trying to find was just a process in the next sort of 12 months, year, to kind of get everything aligned so that... Mm. Um, so we're giving a 35-year lease now, but what's the point in doing that if we're going to go into a subdivision thing and have to come up with a new lease? Well, six years, you've got another one. Why wait for six years? Why not try and get it all tidied up in the next 12 months so that's, there's um, certainty for, for all? That, I mean, that's my view. If there's a way of doing that, maybe a, a resolution to give effect to bringing those issues forward if we can. We kind of, but we want to give some certainty. So, yeah. so I think that we, I mean, what I think what you're hearing is that. We, we kind of want to get to a resolution that yep. um, works for everyone. Yep. Jamie, did you have a question or a comment? No, it's kind of along those same lines. I, I think we are all saying the same things, both as city councillors around the table, but also we have aligned goals as a city council um, and an AMP, as, AMP association. We all want the same thing. Mm. We all recognise the contribution that the AMP show and association makes. Are staff saying that they would... Um, because I actually, you know, I, I, I actually prefer option two. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I want to give the AMP association the certainty that they need, so I have some sympathy around that. Is staff saying that, that it's effectively policy which is prohibiting them from supporting option two? No, we have to do a subdivision. I'm just saying it's highly, that... ir highly irregular. However, it's not impossible. Impossible. No. You know, and that, that's probably the best course of action, if I can say that informally. Yep. Well, you've actually you've got a number of um, backstops, I suppose, in there anyway, which I can. But does <laughs> I thought they were going to try and just see if I could that, memorize does, them. Does that create a time issue? Because then, you could, don't you have to do the hundred years? I'm uh, sorry, the subdivision first before you would enter into agreement. But we that's were, but that's your view anyway. We would do an agreement subject to public consultation, subdivision resource consents for the proposed buildings, all kinds of things. Off to the side, they still have the subdivision issue with their existing lease, which is they know well about. Um, so it's all a big package, really. It's an all-or-nothing situation for them, and I think they're ready to take it on. Yeah. Well, if, that's the, if that is the general feeling of the meeting, then... Um... Can I change it, then? Can I... Can I move... Um... Well, no, no, you don't need to move anything if, if Councillor Scandrett and East... <coughs> agree that it um, conclude lease negotiations up to oh, yes, a maximum term of 100 years. Um, well, it's effectively option two. Yeah. So we just say adopt option two. Yeah. 